just ask that you turn to Matthew 9. We've been looking at Jesus' life in chronological order of events, just things that uh, took place in his ministry. And today, I'm going to ask something challenging of you. We're going to look at three passages of scripture at the same time. Are you ready? Okay. So, yeah, if you've got a phone, this is going to be really difficult. Uh, otherwise, you might get three Bibles going, uh, have it in stereo, just laid out in front of you. This is super biblical nerd stuff. I love it very much. Uh, the three texts we're going to look at are Matthew 9, Mark 2, and Luke 5. Through these three books, we're able to see a pretty detailed description of what happens next here in Jesus' ministry. And I'm going to bounce back and forth between those at times. So, uh, yeah, either use your fingers or be real fast. Uh, but put eyes on the text as much as you possibly can. Again, we, we want to look at this together, not just have someone... Uh, speak it and take their word for it. Always, always, always put your eyes on Scripture. Matthew 9, verse 1 says, Jesus stepped into the boat and crossed over and came to his own town. And Mark 2, verse 1 says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So Jesus takes a boat back to Capernaum. This is after he's called uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they've had that, that uh, the fishers of men story. And Peter having that emotional response and saying, you know, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Uh, this has just happened real recently. And so now Jesus is going back to his own town, to Capernaum. You'd think, you'd think his hometown, his own town would be Nazareth, right? Where, where do you call your own town? Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma. That's a state. Um, the place that you were raised, the place where maybe you live right now, the place where you, you know, reside. Jesus' family says, famously says, you know, the, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Uh, he moves around a lot. He's been, we've seen that. He's been going from town to town, spreading the gospel, just staying wherever. But he calls Capernaum his own town. It's not Nazareth where he grew up. It's not Bethlehem where he was born. What makes Capernaum special? You remember? We talked about it just a few weeks ago. This was the place where people embraced him. In Nazareth, did they embrace him? No! They drove him out. They pushed him out of the place. And it says he could do no miracles there because of their lack of faith. They didn't trust him. They didn't see him as Messiah. And then he goes to Capernaum, and they're like, we are buying what you're selling. You are giving us hope. You are giving us peace. You are, you are saying things that, uh, uh, letting us know about the truth, the gospel, the fact that there is a God that actually loves us, that wants to be active in our lives. You are saying that over us. And they, they had all the faith. And for this, Jesus calls this his own town. You'll recall, they asked him not to leave them. They were like, please, please stay. And guys, would that not be our own homes? Would we not want that of our own town for Jesus to say, oh, that, that is Jesus' own town. I would want that of, of every town uh, surrounding Brooklyn. I would want that of Brooklyn itself. I would want that to be our state, that Jesus would be like, oh, that's Jesus' own state. I'd like that to be our country. I would like that to be our world. Um, guys, I, I would that we have that kind of faith that embraces Jesus, that asks for more of him, that says, please don't go. Stay a while. Linger a little longer. Uh, Mark 2, verse 2. How are you doing so far? Keep it up? Good, because I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're flipping past. Um, oh, you got three Bibles open? Oh, Emmett, always an overachiever. Mark 2, verse 2. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and they preached the word to them. Now, what's interesting is, is uh, Capernaum, they have seen Jesus do signs and wonders before. But right now, it's them hearing the gospel. Why are they showing up? The gospel, just, 
just to hear more about the, the truth of God. And we're also going to see something else in Luke 5, if you want to turn there real quick. Um, right now, we just have God in flesh laying out his desire to know his people and to be known by them. And they are packing this place out. And it is standing room only. And there's people everywhere. And Luke 5, 17 tells us why there's maybe even more people than usual. It's not just the townspeople that want him there. Luke 5, 17 says, One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So the people of Capernaum are there, welcoming Jesus, hearing the gospel, and the religious leaders are there as well. Do you think the religious leaders are there to hear uh, the truth about God and to receive what Jesus has to do? What happened? What happened indeed. Not so much. Um, guys, they, they are coming, as we're about to see, they are coming there to critique and judge the things of God. So we have people that want him, and people that are going to be very critical of him, that are going to try to control uh, Jesus and try to speak down about him. Um, it's important to see the faith and pressing in towards Jesus of the people here, though. The people of Capernaum, they wanted him there. They wanted to hear what he had to say. And that's why we see the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. It's the opposite of Nazareth. Uh, he couldn't heal anyone there because of their lack of faith. But here in Capernaum, faith is everywhere. And Jesus is ready, willing, and able. Uh, remember that because it's going to be very, very relevant here soon. It's this faith that the people have that make Jesus call it his own town that spur along this next scene. Uh, so keeping in Luke 5, 18. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. But they can't get in. Why not? It's too crowded. It's too crowded. Too many uh, we just had a concert last night. Winter so Jam was happening. Was it crowded? So crowded. He said there was like 5,000 people there. We had to like hold on to each other uh, to stay together. Or, or if you've ever gone to the Iowa State Fair, oh. um, my goodness, uh, especially on a Saturday. I remember going with my kids and trying to keep all my, when they were little, trying to keep them all together. It's just a constant sea of people. And I'm just like, I usually liked it in my youth when I didn't have kids to look out. I was like, this is the right place to be. And now that I'm trying to keep my children around me and just wade through the crowds, I'm just like, I want to be at home. I didn't care for it. Uh, I still love it, though. Uh, but so they come up in front of this sea of people. Now, they have an actual need, right? They have a man that they want to bring to Jesus. This person needs their help. This is a friend. They want to get him to Jesus. They come across an obstacle. Okay? I need you to picture that right now with me. They can't get in because everyone in town is there. The religious leaders from all over are there. So I have this question for you real quick. When does your faith stop? Where do you draw the line with your faith? Is it when you see the impossible in front of you? Is it when you see, okay, well, let's just get real here. Let's just understand this is, a, this is now an impossible situation. And so we just have to understand that, nope, we can't go any further. There's no way past this, what I see with my eyes. I now see an impossibility, a problem that I cannot control or surpass in any way. So I just have to understand that that, that is where my faith stops. There's nothing I can do, and I don't see how God could do anything either. Is it when you hear someone say that it's not possible? Guys, I've had amazing faith in my own life uh, where I'm just like, God, I'm just going to trust you through whatever situation, through healing, through finances with my kids, and then I'll have someone come along, a doubting Thomas, if you will, and just whisper in my ear, it's like, well, hey, I don't know if you see what I see, but uh, I think you got a problem here. 
I don't see any way past this. And I'll let that, what somebody says, creep into my heart and, and plant doubts in my life. And I'm like, well, I, th- I thought God was, was all powerful and, and, and had us and I trusted him. But, but now because this one person said, now I'm doubting. Where does your faith stop? Does it stop with your eyes? Does it stop with your ears? Uh, or, or do you just say no to your senses regardless of whatever's happening? And you just trust that no matter what, God is going to see us through. These four men have a problem. They cannot physically get past the crowd. They're carrying a man on a stretcher. They cannot get to Jesus. These four men, it would have been easy, so easy for their faith to stop right there. Look, there's a wall of people. No one is budging. There's no way to get through with our friend on this stretcher. Let's try again eat later when it might be easier. Let's, let's come back when the crowd has died down. But these four men, their faith didn't stop just because they were presented with a challenge. Because the question they were really asking was, how do we get closer to Jesus despite the obstacle in our way? If that's your question, if you truly want to draw closer to Jesus, the obstacle does not stand a chance. In verse 19, someone got an idea. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. If you cannot see a way, guys, to Jesus through conventional means, have you tried unconventional ones? I've seen so many people come to me about, well, I just, I don't understand. I don't feel close to God. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like he's in front of me. I don't feel like he's with me. And I'll be like, well, what are you doing? I like, well, I go to church every Sunday. Well, most Sundays, some Sundays, I go to church. I know of a church. I'm in the same vicinity of a church. I just don't, I just don't feel like I, he's in front of me. And I'm like, well, have you tried unconventional means? Well, like, what do you mean? I mean, like, you know, trying to spend time with them outside of church. Like open up your Bible, seeing, seeing what the word of God says. Have you tried going to someone, a friend, and, and asking them to pray for you, to lay hands on you, to, to believe with you, to walk through this life with you? Have you tried those unconventional things? Like maybe church on more than just a Sunday. Your purpose should be to get closer to him, to get right in front of him. And guys, I say this with all sincerity, with all the love in my heart. If you can't, if you are struggling and you feel like you cannot get there on your own, but you want to, ask someone to lift you up, to carry you there and understand that you are not a burden I need you to know that. There's so many people in our society today that are just like, I don't, I don't want to burden anyone with my problems. I don't, want to, I don't want to show vulnerability because then people will have to go out of their way to help me. And Good! Do that, please. Share. Unload your burden. We are called to do that with each other. We are called not to take on the world all by ourselves, but to, to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. To confess our sins one to another so that there may be healing. Sorry, I got all excited. Um, We are all, uh, we have to understand, we've all been there, right? We've all carried a burden from time to time. We might be carrying a burden now. And we have to trust each other uh, to help each other. And... If it's not me today, it might be me tomorrow. And if it's you now, then guys, let's make let's make it happen. Let's not wait. I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of this. Let's not wait. Let's take care of this today. Let's make a commitment today to walk through this life together, to pray for each other, to lift each other up, to get each other in front of Jesus. Let's be willing to show up for each other, to carry each other when necessary. Look at the, uh, the word they in verse 19. 
They could not find a way. They went up to the roof. It was a group effort. Guys, that is the power of the church. Our faith. Not in each other, but in our ability to help get each other in front of Jesus, to God. No matter what the obstacle is, no matter what sin, no matter what addiction, what hopelessness, what ailment, what height or depth, we hold to the fact that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. We're going to see things in our way all the time, guys. Um, your schedule, your, your busy, your addiction, um, other people. You're, you're going to have this constantly. Uh, things that are trying to get in the way. We're going to see uh, that's not possible. And when we find a way to draw closer, we still might see a roof between us and Jesus. Um, Mark 2, you can turn there if you want. I'm just going to reference it real quick. Um, I'm going to stay mostly in Luke here. Uh, but can you imagine you got through the crowds? Uh, you, got, you didn't get through the crowds. You got over the crowds. You're like, I see a way of roof access. And then you get to the roof. And are they in front of Jesus? No, there's still a roof. There's still a thing you have to get through. Are you any closer to Jesus now than you were? A little bit. But there's still this roof in the way. And look what they have. And Mark 2 says they had to dig through it. It wasn't just, you know, ha, 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 remove some leaves. I love, I love the Chosen series. I love it. In the Chosen, they're just like, I don't move these palm branches. And it's fine. Look, it's super easy. Um... But uh, Mark 2 lets us know they, they had to dig through it. They had to put forth some real effort. They had to get through this. Uh, and they were willing to do what it took. And they carried their friend to this roof. They had to exert more effort. The second obstacle in their way still didn't stop them. They were still undeterred. They removed it and lowered their friend down. They did. Together. Why? Because they had faith that the power of the Lord was on Jesus to heal the sick. They believed. They trusted. They knew all they had to do was get this man in front of Jesus. Jesus would take care of the rest. All three Gospels have a version of this next sentence. Matthew 9, verse 2. Mark 2, verse 5. And Luke 5, verse 20. They all say just about the same thing. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, friend, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> I love that. Whose faith, whose faith did Jesus see? Was it, was it my faith? Was it, was it his faith? It was their faith. It was our faith. I don't know about you, but I don't want my path to the feet of Jesus to be alone. I want to help carry someone to him while I'm on my way. And at times, I want someone to help carry me. That is the church. That is not a building. That is a people in one accord determined with a mindset that says I don't care what it takes I am committed to getting anyone who wants to to the feet of Jesus I don't care about their past or their circumstance or what's in front of us trying to block the way if that's where you want to be I'm committed to helping you get there through my abilities through my talent? No. Through faith. Just through trusting that he's going to meet us there. No matter what's in my way. It's that faith that God has always credited to us as righteousness. Even, even when we still 
reek of sin. He looks at us and he sees us like sheep that have gone astray. We just talked about that last week. And the first thing he does when we get to his feet, even though we have not done anything to deserve it, he looks at us and he says, friend, you got here. You got here. Friend, your sins are forgiven. You like how the paralyzed man didn't do anything? Why did the paralyzed man get to the feet of Jesus to begin with? He doesn't want to be paralyzed anymore, right? But what did Jesus take care of first? Sins. The unrighteousness that was on him. And does the paralyzed man throw himself at the feet of Jesus? Does he, does he beg for forgiveness? No, he did the hard part. He just got there in front of him. His friends got him there. And Jesus takes care of the first and most important thing first. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Jesus does the hard part. We're meant to be a part of each other's journey to the feet of Jesus. There's a popular verse that's often taken out of context in Matthew 18. Where two or more... Or, sorry, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And I've, I've used this out of context myself. I've, I've been like, well, is, that means, you know, when, when two or more gather that we're having church. I mean, yes, I believe that. 100% believe that. But that whole passage of scripture, that whole passage of scripture is uh, about dealing with sin. Uh, about how we're supposed to come to Jesus and trust him to do the hard part. Uh, about what we do, how we should not cause each other to stumble. Uh, about how Jesus has done the hard part, leaving the 90 and 9, going to great lengths to seek out the lost, to find him. To dealing with sin in the church, where we come together, where, where if we go to a brother and we talk to them about the sin, saying, I want to help you get to the feet of Jesus. And if that person is like, no! How then two or more gather together and we say, we want to help you. We want to be your they. We want to have faith with you and stand with you. And then hopefully they say, yeah, I'll get through whatever obstacle. You, you just help get me there because I can't get there on my own. I need your help. And it says, truly I tell you. Um, okay, verse 17 if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And the next part is about the forgiveness of the unmerciful servant. This whole passage is about how we deal with sin. How we're meant to deal with it together. Uh, how do we often deal with sin? Oh, alone. By ourselves. In sheer isolation. We tell no one. At no time do we want to burden anyone. What was, what was the go-to response with Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden? Hide. They hid. And do we still hide today? Yes. All the time. And you know what keeps us from hiding? They. They. At some point, I, I can't wait to find out the whole story when I get to heaven. At some point, either that paralytic man asked their friends, I, I heard Jesus is in town, will you please do the thing I can and get me there? Or one of those friends said, Hey, our brother, our friend is in need. He can't get there on himself. Let's lift him up together. Either way, the story is cool. And either way, the story defies isolation. And it's a call to need someone other than yourself. It's a call to refuse to let a need be hidden, but to be brought out into the light and say, Hey, I can't. I'm struggling. I need us. I need our faith, our trust that Jesus is going to be enough to do the hard part. I just need a little help getting there. That's 
why the they is so important. That's why the church exists. But remember real quick, uh, these, these four men might not have understood everything that was happening, but they acted in faith, and Jesus did the thing that mattered more than his illness. He took away the sin. And uh, in Luke 5, 21, we're now reminded that other than the people of Capernaum, who were there? The Pharisees. All the religious leaders that came from all over. They're there. And they're probably not going to be happy about that forgiveness of sin part. Mm -hmm. Yep. 521. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. The Pharisees could only see the impossible. Understand the difference between those four men and the Pharisees. The four men were like, that's impossible, but ah, we'll find a way. And the Pharisees were like, that's impossible, and it's only impossible. <laughs> right? Makes sense. That ever-present need, that's what they had in mind. That ever-present need for, for a, a, a sacrifice, a traditional sacrifice, because we can't ever achieve perfection. They did not have faith in the Son of God. And Jesus sees this for what it really is. It's a heart issue. So Jesus shows them the thing that their eyes can see and tells the man to walk. And, and it says, everyone rejoices. Let's clarify there. Uh, everyone meant the friends, the paralytic man, the people of the town that wanted him, that called uh, him, his, him Jesus' own town, not the religious leaders. And we know this because of the very next story, which isn't really the next story, but the same story. Remember again, this is very close to Peter being called into Jesus' ministry. And what did he tell Jesus when he fell to his feet on the shore? Get away from me, I'm a sinful man. And what have we been dealing with? Forgiveness of sins. Getting, getting all that stuff. Jesus, I love what Jesus does very quickly. Early on in his ministry, he's just like, we're just gonna, just gonna get all this stuff out of your way. Let me just let me just take that for you. You got to the feet of Jesus, and then Jesus is just gonna take care of the rest. Jesus is gonna call you into a new life, a new creation. Um, Jesus did that impossible thing. Uh, all Peter had to do was get in front of Jesus. Jesus wants to and can forgive your sin, but you've got to trust him to do it, to do the impossible. And remember, if you're struggling, we can get there together. So this next bit in Luke 5 also happens in all three Gospels, right after healing the paralytic. Luke 5, 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Levi here is also known as another name. Just like Simon is also known as Peter, Levi is known as Matthew. Matthew would have been reviled as a tax collector. Because the Israelites would have seen that, okay, you're actually working for the Romans. They're the enemy because the Romans are occupying this nation, and he would have been seen as a traitor amongst their people. And Levi, we see him just drop everything, just like Peter, Andrew, James, and John drop their nets on the shore, and they follow Jesus. Then look what Levi does next. And guys, this part is amazing. I love it so much. We tend to, when we're studying scripture, we just blow pie, and we're like, oh, they had a party. That's so great. How does it tie to the whole? How does it tie to the story, the journey we've been on so far? Uh, 29, verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. 
Would this have been a popular party by, by Jewish standards? Would they have liked that this party was happening? Would it have been like, whoa, 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 they sent me an RSVP, but I am not going. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complain to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? What does Levi do when he drops everything and follows Jesus? Does he keep it to himself? Does he keep the glory of God in isolation? No, he does not. He invites all the people who are unpopular like him, other tax collectors and sinners, people that are, that are seen as less than in society. And he invites them to sit down at his table where Jesus is at. What did Levi just do? It's not as flashy as, as four men finding a way up on top of a roof and digging through a roof and lowering them on a stretcher down to the feet of Jesus. But the result is the same. Jesus just got all these people together that, that needed hope, that needed love, that needed to remind them that Jesus loves them too and is seeking after them too, because these are the one of the 99, and now they're at the table with Jesus, and Jesus, guys, I, he couldn't have been happier right then. He's just like, yay, this is awesome. Let me, tell you about, let me tell you about love. Let me tell you about repentance. Let me tell you about the forgiveness of sins. They're at the feet of Jesus. Um, and surprise, uh, the religious leaders don't like that. They're, has that changed at all today in our society? <laughs> no, no. Um, you see, uh, what Jesus said earlier, this is a heart issue. This is a heart issue. Verse 31, Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I say this very carefully, and I don't want you to misunderstand me when I say this. More of us need to be inviting sinners to our tables. More of us need to be willing to get really unconventional in our witnessing. Uh, more of us need to be going out of our way to draw people to the feet of Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about people that are, are like, when you go to them and you're like, hey, would you, would you like to talk about God? How's your relationship with God? You know, tell, tell me about you know, uh, what you believe and more of that. And I had a person a couple months back that we started a conversation. And it was very clear very early on that it's like, oh, okay. You have no desire to get to the feet of Jesus. Okay. I know where you stand. And I don't hate that person. And I don't not love that person. And I pray for that person. But then I go to the next person. Because if I spend all my time on someone who does not want to go to the feet of Jesus, I'm neglecting someone else who hasn't heard about the opportunity to even get to the feet of Jesus. But we do. Uh, pray. Ask. Ask God. Lord, send me to those people. Send me to, to people that right now feel that they're less than. For whatever reason, for a whole host of reasons that the world, that the devil has convinced us to believe we're not worthy to get in front of Jesus, Jesus would say, absolutely, get them, get them in front of Jesus. We are called to step out in faith, guys. Um, your sin or circumstance might do everything it possibly can to stop you. But if you keep going, you will get in front of Jesus. And his first priority will always be that sin. He wants to forgive you and turn you from it. 31 ends right there. Sorry, verse 32 ends with that last phrase. Repentance. Sinners to repentance. That's how you know someone's faith is genuine. That's the fruit that is visible. Because they turned from sin to Jesus and followed him. You can't follow sin and Jesus at the same time. You can't. You're either going towards one or towards the other. None of us are standing still. We're either drawing closer to him or away from him. Repenting is taking that first step 
Repenting is really just purposing to turn away from sin to God. And here's the cool thing. It doesn't matter how far we were from him. As soon as we turn, he's right there. He's right there. He's ready to meet us. He already yeah, he already got off uh, where he was, uh, where he was sitting, where he was at, whatever he was doing, and he ran to you. He ran to where you're at. Because he's ready to meet us. He's always ready to meet us. We have to choose to draw near to him, even when it seems impossible. Because of your, your past or circumstance or whatever. It does not matter. Jesus wants to do the impossible if you'll let him. And if you need help getting there for whatever reason, I would like to pray with you today. Uh, I'm going to bless us. And then if you're saying, I need to be carried a little. Awesome. You are in the right place for that. So don't. Guys, don't shy away just because you might feel uncomfortable and you were always taught not to need people. We're supposed to need each other. So let's help get each other in front of Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. Oh, may he, oh, may his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May you understand a, a father's heart just his love for you that is all-encompassing. No matter what you've done or could do, he'll never leave you or forsake you. He wants to pour out his blessings on you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to offer you a fresh start. May he turn his face towards you. May you, may you understand what it means to be seen by him. And may he give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.